Well, Alana, can you turn that porno music off, please? Off? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck's that? Is that you? <laughs> I yanked his foot. <laughs> Alright. This is the second last video of this series. Now, Susie's so got a luncheon tonight with her friends. We've got this beautiful table setting. We've got Royal Albert, we've got Fruit Loops, MMs. I just thought I'd get in here first before her friends did. Do you want to come Have a minute. I know that frightened the crap out of me. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Actually, do you want some more? Right, well, I fitted the new boot lock and that's all working nicely. It is a little bit stiff because of um, the pressure the, the, the seal's putting on. But in doing that, I've actually pulled this out. I've damaged this, the, the remote boot release. It's pulled straight out of that little, um, well, that little clamp sort of thing, that, that little fitting. And so what's happened is, I've, this is easy to cut this stuff and there's plenty of spare because it's actually a bit too long for the car, but I've just cut a couple of inches off just by scoring it with a Dremel and it just sort of snaps off and I'll put that ferrule back on um, but I've got to figure a way of sort of looping that round because that press fit isn't going to cut it um, I, I didn't even have to pull it that hard it just sort of released other work going on Jason's done the um, the seat cushion that's just sitting there and of course the rear cushion he offered to do again because I hadn't done a very good job got some seat belts sitting up there on the parcel tray they're all fitted um, got this one here that's done and this one's sort of all nicely done so we're still pressing forward our oh, boot release saga I've just um looped the cable this camera doesn't focus over that uh, over that pin I've taken that fitting out I just got an old electrical terminal well it's not an old one it's a new one and cut off the crimp section and crimp that on there and I'll solder that now hopefully that uh, that, that remains effective the other thing, of course, when you're cutting this sort of cable, you cut it off with a Dremel and it leaves little bits and pieces like that there. Um, where is it there? So just go around with a magnet and just pick it up so none of it sticks in your carpet because if it sticks in your carpet, it's hard to get out. Oh, well, I got it back together. I guess we'll try that, I suppose. It's not bolted down properly, but uh -huh, it worked. Just in case it was a fluke, we'll try again. Oh, that'll do for me. Excellent. Job done. Just taking a look at the seat runners now. I've been cleaning up a few parts. That's one I've sort of fixed up there. It's nice and smooth. Um, so I can put that to the side. Um, these looked fairly rusty, but they're actually in really, really good nick. It's just a matter of sort of cleaning up the roller balls, I'm doing that on a bit of scotch right there um, putting these nylon spaces back in, or nylon guides back in, they sort of run underneath here and attached to these sort of cutouts there and there, so just got to put them all back together, I've got, I, re I did the other two but Ray ended up giving me these ones, which are better because some of the runners have uh, a square hole the early ones seem to have a square hole with the, um, oh it's here yeah, it's there, sorry. The square hole at the bottom, and that's one of the bolts there. And the square hole means there's a bit of um, a bit of slop in there where the round one's going to fit much better. So I'm going to clean these ones up. This is a very good one. It's nice and free. I'll, I'll lubricate that and clean it up. And this one's a little bit stiff. You can buy new uh, repro runners for 145 a pair. If I need to, I'll get them, of course. But I don't think I do. I think these are going to be just as good. This one was hellish to separate. There's a lot of sort of rust in there, but it's not structural, it's just surface rust. But what's happened, um, oh, I can't find it now, where is it? Oh. oh, here we go. What's happened is it's actually mangled the ball. So it's been moved around while that's seized. Hasn't damaged the casing, thankfully. But normally with the balls, all you need to do is just get a bit of scotch bright like this and just run them over. And you can get them off and they come up quite clean. So I'll just continue to do that. Um, I've got another runner I can raid parts out of and just get a wire brush and a drill and just clean all this out because once it's clean, lubricated and painted it won't be um, distinguishable and it's used from a new one 
Now these are really useful. These are available as a set of three. Um, these wire brush attachments for the drill. They're only about, I think, about twelve or fifteen dollars or something from the local hardware. This one's absolutely knackered because I've overused it. But you can sort of get right in with it. This is a reversible drill, so we can sort of run along like that. And we can clean those channels out beautifully. You can see that's all bare metal in there now. Oops. And it takes minimal uh, with a wire brush and a drill. Now once that's to get it looking like that. Now once that's greased with the balls and everything clean and the guides all cleaned up, that's going to slide beautifully. Whenever I go to film something I always turn the radio off and um, I keep turning it off and putting it on because um, I don't want to get done for copyright and all that sort of stuff. But you can see how well these work. You gotta hang on to it a bit though. Now I'm still working on these recliners and I'm getting them absolutely perfect in terms of nice and straight with a good surface to prepare. Now I'm gonna to have to go back on what I said before and that's the planned finish for these. I was going to use, or still, I'm still gonna use, but I'm not gonna do it in this series, out the spray on chrome, which is basically a very high sheen base coat with a bunch of activators and silvering solutions sprayed onto them with spritz bottles and then clear coat it again. And the problem I'm having is the temperature in here. Um, we're sitting on sort of 12 degrees and 90% humidity, and that's absolutely wrong for the finish. We can't do it. So for the meantime, or in the meantime, we're gonna to have to paint them, um, which doesn't matter because I can still level them up or key them back later and use the base coat system um, for the, the chroming solution, if you know what I mean. I thought about setting up that little Toyota shell there as an oven, um, putting a fan heater in it and curtaining it off so I can get 50 degrees, which is what they want to, to bake it uh, in the colder climates. But the, the problem I'm having is that I need to get this car roadworthy and exhaust fitted, front end alignment, that sort of thing. And I need to get it done in the next couple of months. Um, and in those next couple of months, it still might not be the right conditions to use the chroming system. So I'm sorry, it's, um, I can't show it to you now. When I do it, I'll, um, I'll do a separate video on it. I won't run it in this series. I'll run it on a separate video. Yeah, it's a bit of a bummer, really. I, it's not really what I want. But I can't do the system with this. I've even tried a gas heater in here to, um, to try and bring the temperature up, and it's not working. So I'm just going to have to get stuck with this way for now. Well, probably disappointing for some, but I've got these things done. I've just clear coated them and they're nice and smooth. They actually can be color sanded and buffed so they can be really, really high shine. But it doesn't matter because what I can do um, is, is take them right back so they're dead flat. They're pretty good now. And um, do the chrome treatment on them later. But for now, I'm not going to bother because I want to get the thing roadworthy. Dicky seat uprights are over there. Same sort of deal as that. Um, these are painted. These parts are painted in the same uh, silver I bought for the XD for the wheels, um, which I ended up mixing with a nutmeg color to make a, a kind of a champagne colour, but these are um, just silver metallic, basically. It's a sort of a bluish silver, and I did the wiper motor in the same colour, which is pretty cool. Uh, window binder kits, these are lovely. You get the plastic insulator so you don't chew up your door trim, and of course they come with a nice new handle, as well as that little sticker there and the screw, which is cool. So I can put those on. Um, but I can't put the door trim on until I've done the mirror. Now I've got oh, a few other bits here. I actually got this. This is, my daughter did this for me in kindergarten. It reads, my dad's name is Peter. He has black eyes and black hair. He draws at work. He has heaps of money. My dad is four years old. I love my dad because he cuddles me. Alana. Well, I haven't got heaps of money and I'm a bit older than four, but I thought that was really sweet. She did that in kindergarten. And of course, a few bits have fallen off. So I've got to hot glue those on with a little hot glue gun. Uh, but the real reason I've got that gun out is I want to show you a couple of things with the mirror. I think that's where it went. Well, we'll let that go off. In the meantime, we'll have a look at the mirror. Well, this is my favorite grease. This is high temperature bearing. And we want to use something like that in the car because it has a very high boiling point. It just makes wheel bearings, basically. But in doing that, it's an excellent, excellent lubricant for seat runners. The only problem with grease is it tends to attract dirt. Dirt sticks to it. So a lot of, over the years, you know, lint and that sort of thing will probably be attracted to it. But running over the carpet, that sort of thing where static electricity can be built up, but end of the day, it's the best stuff for the job. 
So I've just greased underneath these, this lip here and where the balls run and I'll do the same inside here. I'm not going to grease up that channel there though because I don't want the, um, the nylons coming out but I'll grease over the nylons if that makes any sense. So this is a later model runner. I'm just hoping it's, it's all good. It, it fits alright and everything so that's cool. And of course we're now going to put these on. These little runners here. I haven't done a very good job cleaning those but some, well, sometimes you have to say stiff bickies. So I'm just going to grease over there and here as well. And of course when we paint them we'll just get some prep wash and um, run over it with prep wash. So that should slide nice and easy and I'm holding it up. That'll drop down and in dropping down those nylons are going to come out. Have I got this the right way? Yeah. So I'm just going to run it in. And what you'll find, there's another set of nylons go there. And what you'll find, I'm going to get the bloody thing in. I'm stuck. Hang on, I'm stuck. What am I stuck on? Is it that thing? Yeah. What you'll find is the ball, the roller actually holds that up, which holds those nylons in. Those nylon skates in. So I'll just take our ball and I'll give it some grief. And what happens is that that seat, there's a, a seat runner bolt that will hold all this, this ball in from coming out. So the ball's just sitting there and I can probably run over it now. There we go. And you'll see that'll start sliding really easily. But before we lock it into place, so to speak, we've got to put these two nylon skates in here. Mmm. Cup of tea. Now, again, we're just cleaning up bolts. They look a little bit rusty. It's just surface rust. There's nothing wrong with them. So I'm just sort of screwing them into a die, a 516 coarse die, and then cleaning the heads up with a bit of scotch bright. Okay, I'm going to be a bit rough now. Like I bought one. I'm just dusting over these parts with a bit of cheap $3 rattle can rubbish from local hardware. Um, good thing about this stuff is it sticks to pretty much anything. I painted the heater box in the MG and this stuff about eight or nine years ago, eight years ago probably, and it's still nice and shiny. Um, and don't think for a second that these lovely new seat runners you're buying from on eBay are <laughs> painted in two pack or anything, it's probably just this stuff. I'll give them a second lick over after it. Also, being enamel, it's got a lot of give in it, and it won't fall off the springs either. What's particularly worthy of note are these cushion frames now. I was warned that these wouldn't fit these XY covers and they didn't and Jason's ended up um, narrowing, the frame at the, oh, narrowing the frame at the top and adding bits around. I've got a slideshow, a bunch of photos he sent me and I sort of put that together and he made these boards up and put those on and he's absolutely knocked it out of the park. It's really, really nice how he's done it. So we've got to uh, fit those. But You can see the difference here between the XY Fairmont squab frame on the left to mine which is on the right. The XY frame's taller and tapers in toward the top. And here they are with the foam installed, which again is totally different. So we took measurements and begun fabricating the top shells to emulate the XY frame. He also needed to fit side pieces so the backboards had something to attach to. Remember the early seats didn't have a backboard, they were sewn all the way around. Being an upholsterer by trade, Jason adopted some old school methods in the way he approached his work. This is some underlay stitch to Hessian, the spring protector system to eliminate the chance of the springs chafing the foam. This was stitched again, this time to the frames. Well protected. So some trimmer's foam was added to relevant areas to aid in the shaping of the new vinyl covers. And the covers were then fitted. And don't forget that these aren't great fitting covers. They're made from a pattern and were very cheap. Many of them didn't fit at all and were really worked into place. Here are the cushions and here's work being undertaken on one of the squabs. Almost there before the rear panels are fitted. And a completed seat propped up for the photo. Jason's car is a beautiful XW Fairmont wagon. Every hang on now has been gapped professionally. It's now painted in two-pack wild violet and will shortly receive its lovely overhauled 252V engine. When reassembling these things, don't forget uh, to run a 5 16th coarse, coarse tap sorry, down through these threads here. These were powder coated, 
Um, and they were also a bit rusty when I got them, so there was a bit of muck in there, not too much, but enough to cause concern. And we can just sort of bang it together nice and quickly now. Um, and do some adjustments, that sort of thing. And it just goes in beautifully. I've left the spring off there, so I can just pull that down and line up this hole here. Um, and it's, look, it's coming across, coming along beautifully. I'm very, very happy with it. We can just put that spring on and we're almost good to go. So I've got them together. I hope that's right. I think that's right. I've got a seat belt bolt, a seat bolt kit, sorry, and one side has a spacer on it that goes through to the floor. Comes with a whole lot of new hardware nuts and all this sort of stuff. I'm going to do something quite unorthodox. I'm going to actually fit this space in the car uh, with the hope of putting the squab on later because when I go to put this in with the squab on and the bolts hang out, I'm more likely to scratch something. So I'm just going to try and see how it goes. Well, the, well, the driver's seat base is just sitting there for now. It's up on that stud there. There's a lot of room there, but I can see here. I'm going to remove it again just so I can screw that down permanently because um, I can't get a drill in there, obviously I don't want to damage it. But it looks like it's going to go well. Well, I've got these two front seat bases in. Um, it is going to wind up being quite easy just to hook that over that little pivot there. And I'll get the, the kids to help me, but then I can just sort of secure it down there. You can reach these screw holes quite well, or at least quite easily. There's one there, and there's one there. And so they're very accessible from the outside. So I'm going to do it that way. Just means it gets them off the, gar the garage floor. Um, but it is actually starting to look really good. Excellent. Now, here's our mirror. And this is the old mirror glass. As you can see, it's all sort of damaged. And most of them damaged by leaving spots like that. Now, the reason for that is because they have three little springs in them. I've lost one of them. I don't care because I'm not going to reuse them. And they're stuck in to keep a bit of spring pressure against the glass which is then held in by this ring. Now what holds these in the right um, orientation, I suppose, is they're sort of clamped over this thing. It looks a bit like a post-it now. It's a bit thicker. Now the problem with that, of course, is moisture gets in and it starts to rust. And it also reacts with the coating of the back of the glass. So that's no good. Now a lot of people use a celastic sealer for putting mirror glasses in. And that's fine to use, but you must use a neutral cure. Now, Celastic comes in two types. It comes in Acetic Cure, which smells like vinegar. You cannot use that. It'll eat into the back coating. And it also comes in Neutral Cure, which is what they use uh, for roof and gutter and for fish tanks and stuff like that. And that's the one you've got to use. The one that actually smells of nothing, which is what this is. Now, when I had this mirror glass cut, I got a new glass cut, which is this one here. And I got it. It's not smoked. It's just standard glass, which is fine. And they thought they were doing me a favour by gluing it in. It's too far in. It looks terrible. Now, I'm not going to spring load this. I'm going to glue, or I'm going to get this little hot glue gun, and I'm going to make little piers on it so the glass sits at the level I want it to. I'll let them go off, and I'll cut them to size, and then I'll use the elastic to glue it in. But all they have to do, and they don't stick too well, I'm just sort of putting it over those little piers, those spring piers, and what that's going to do is it's going to set the height that I want the glass to sit at. And of course, that'll give it time to go off, so the elastic to go off, so it stays in the right, at the right height. Because otherwise, when you put them in, the, uh, the mirror itself is far too laid back. Now, this is just a cheap hot glue gun. This is from one of those, I don't know, crafty places where you buy buttons and icy pole sticks from. Um, they're pretty much available anywhere. You can get them online as well. So I'll just keep adding to that, just to give it a bit of height. That ring's only really useful if um, the, if you want the glass to be spring-loaded and it's like that to stop it rattling around, but with a bit of elastic there, then it should be all right. Now, I'm not going to cover the whole thing in goop and then plonk that in because that way, if anything ever goes wrong with this glass, I can get it out pretty easily if I don't do that. But um, that'll do for now. I reckon that's the best way of doing it. Right, I've got those piers sitting there. They don't stick. This hot glue doesn't stick, but of course, it's got a little hole in which will locate on those pegs, which is what I wanted. And of course, when I get the new mirror glass, it'll sit where I wanted it to sit. I mean, it's not quite there yet. I've got to cut these to size. But you can see then it's right near the edge, which is where I wanted it. It's only got to locate for now.
I just don't want to get this stuff all over the place. Oh, there go the dogs. There you go the dogs. I might try and put this in. It might look a bit better if I put it in. So I'm just going to use a tiny, this is just a bit of GP thinners. And I don't want it going all in there. I got that ring in and um, it ended up being quite easy once I turned it around the other way. So that will all just come off. All that excess goop will come off with a bit of thinner. And it putting the ring back in isn't absolutely necessary because it's going to be glued anyhow, but it does give a much nicer look, more a sort of a more factory look if you look that closely, which a lot of people probably don't at mirrors, but there you go. That looks rather good, doesn't it? And we just got to be very careful when we cut around here. You should use a modelling knife, I suppose, but we don't want the door, the window winder handle grabbing the vinyl or the foam and you know buggering it up. So I'm just going to go around here gently, just so that that spindle can turn without gathering or without grabbing any of the vinyl. And then of course we just want to grab this insulator, this plastic insulator, and stick it behind. I'll move that one. I like them sort of like that. I've always done. I don't know what the correct position was for them, but I just like them like that. I'll just stick a screw in. And then we can just put it into place. Bit of residue there. Beautiful. I'm happy with that. Now really when you start gapping your doors, you're supposed to put your door seals on, which I didn't because I was slack and I didn't have them. And there's a bit of controversy about these door seals in that a lot of them don't fit apparently. These are from Muscle Car Parts Australia and they're absolutely brilliant. I've fitted three of them and they are almost half the price of other people's uh, equivalent product. Um, these were $160 plus 20 bucks postage and I got them the day after because they were overnighted. Um, now in order to fit them, I'm just going to work out the orientation of it, they're really really simple and they lock in beautifully and I'm just going to um, use a phone and they just sort of poke in like that and that sort of locks them in. So I'll just run around and put them in and they're snapping beautifully. The fit on these is wonderful. That um, I was warned by several people that make sure you get, there was another brand that was particularly known to be reputable because they fitted the best, but these are wonderful. I've got no uh, issue with these whatsoever. Um, hopefully this one goes in well, because the other three did. So I'll just run around and poke that in. This one has a red colored sort of Christmas tree clamp. Um, they seem a bit stiffer to get in than the other ones. I'm just using a piece of wood just to sit over the top of it and give it a tap in. Um, one of the other ones had a blue one, or two of the others, so had blue ones, and they just pushed in with your fingers. But these aren't any great deal, you can just knock them in with a bit of wood. And of course the test. is a piece of paper. And they seem to be pretty good. That's cool. Now I'm having a bit of trouble. The old um, reclining knob works really well. The new one is locking up. And this is why I don't throw the old parts out until I'm really finished with them because this one as it turns out has 60 point, that's 60.2 millimeters clearance where this one that's 59.2. So these are a millimetre. The reproduction ones are a millimetre too small on the insides. A little bit more. Try that, eh? Yep. 
perfect. Beautiful. All right, well, I can put that back together. Just gotta make sure I don't scratch the painting I've done. You just tighten it up with a screwdriver and a, a spanner. Let's see how that goes. Alright. We've got the recliner working. Whoa! That's cool. Well, that's really cool, and what's even better about this car. As I said in here, it has the new car smell, which um, when you think about all the new car smell is, is new materials and adhesives, but this is really, really cool. Very comfortable. It's been exactly, today's the 9th of, um, 9th of July 2015. It's exactly two years, or it's exactly two years since we, um, or since I bought the car. And so 9th of July 2013, I parked it out there and shot the first um, chapter of this, if you like. Starting with, I uh, just bought myself a six-cylinder Falcon 500. Um, I didn't start it till the 20th, and on the 20th I started pulling it apart, and of course that's when we we did the second one. So two years, I estimated two years to finish it, and I'm going to go over by probably a month. I've got to save up a bit of money and get exhausted and all that sort of stuff. But aside from that, it's all looking really, really good. Once again, the colour is really bad on this camera, but you can see these mechanisms here. They're lovely and smooth, and to be honest, they're not even going to worry me, I don't reckon, leaving them like that. I'm just going to uh, reassemble the dicky seat now. So oh, here's a here's our dicky seat, and I think these go this way. I'll, I'll scratch that. And we put our screws in, and so I'll just stick this together and see how it goes. The other thing I've done, of course, I've put this rear bumper on. Now, this is the original rear bumper. I've just run a bit of a buff over it. It's not a very good one. There are a couple of scratches there. And there's a dent somewhere. Where's the dent? The dent is there. There's a dent there. So that's not the, um, the final uh, fitting rear bumper, but I need it for the exhaust place because I need to find out, or they need to see exactly where to space the tips because it's going to have dual exhaust fitted reasonably short. Right, well, I want to talk about tail shafts. This is the original one out of the car, the six cylinder. Uh, this is 2.7 inch or 70 millimeters. This one's 82 mil. This one was out of an XD351, but the car was originally a six. Um, I've had this for about eight or nine years. I bought it with the engine that I got. Um, but it wasn't the original one out of the car, so it could be XC or something like that. I think it is an XC one. So these colour stripes aren't relevant to the XWXY range. Now there's a million different lengths of these things, and some of them are only sort of 5 and 10 millimetres difference within each other. Um, between Falcons and Mustangs, there's a lot of difference, and we really do need to check that this is going to be the right one for the car. Now I spoke to a... Uh, a drive shaft specialist and he said at standard ride height there needs to be 20 to 25 millimeters um, play or, or room for the yoke to move right into the back of the transmission so at standard ride height we're looking at 20 to 25 millimeters of, uh, of play so of course to achieve that we put the car up on axle stands under the rear axle and we can measure it that way now the other thing I've done is I've taken the, the stands out and put them under the car and let the axle hang right down and that will effectively close that gap up because when you push the car up, what's happening is the rear shackle is going to move back. So as the car is going over bumps, the back wheel is effectively going up and down in this sort of arrangement. That's exaggerated, of course. And so with this car being so high up off the ground and having to settle more, that means that that room, that 20 millimetres of room I've got, is going to open up to about 25 mil once the car's lowered a bit. We really need to make sure that once this is hanging right down as far as it can go, there's still enough room for the tail shaft to, or for the yoke not to touch the back of the transmission. Because if that happens, it's not just very dangerous, but it's going to shunt into the back of the gearbox and cause all sorts of damage. So I'm going to go with this tail shaft. Um, I'm confident it's the right length. I've got to pop that uni at the moment. But the first thing I've done is I've just got on the trestle table here and I've got the weights on the outside. I'm just going to roll it around to make sure it's rolling true, which it is. Um, you'll soon pick up very quickly if there's a bent tail shaft, it'll sort of, you know, roll unevenly. 
and then of course I'm just going to pop out these securing clips. There's one there and there's one here. The new universals, I'm going around the tripod here, I'm trying to anyway. The new universals will come with new ones. You can sort of just knock them with a screwdriver and flick them out. That's them there. So we'll get those out. And using a couple of sockets, we can sort of squeeze it out and sort of release that one. I'm going to push it back that way to get this one out, and then the uni will just pop out. So I'll stick it back in here. Um. Hello. Hello. See? Uni. Oh my god, Gary. So, what we can do now... Okay. What we can do now is go and get some new unis. Give our tail sharp a nice paint job, but we know that's the right one for the job. Yeah, a little dirty. Okay. Um... The spa... <laughs> okay, no, stop it, please. Hi. Okay. Okay, um, the spa, there's like a huge... Yeah, I know. I've got to get a new lid for it. Yeah. Let's go into something more interesting. Just taking all the paint off this to make sure it's absolutely straight and it's got no damage anywhere. There's a bit more finishing after doing these sorts of areas, then I'll give it a paint job. But all told, it's looking really, really good now. I'm pleased with it. Um, and I'll also check out the welds around the end where the yolks are. Or where the flanges are, I should say. But that's looking really good. I'm happy with that. What do you think, Charlie? Mm-hmm. Charlie's bored, he's not really into tail shafts at all. Uh, tail shafts aren't happy. Nope. Okay. I'll get back to work. There are other books or something, I don't know. Not rude ones, I hope. Yeah. You do what you want to do. Yeah. It's not going to bother me and we'll be supportive. Some things take a little while to get used to in terms yeah, of the idea of them. And that's all good. And it's part of it, you know. I mean, no child ever takes the path their parents sort of expect them to when they're young. Yeah. And that goes into, you know, businesses and stuff like that. And it goes into plenty of things. Yeah, and it doesn't matter, it's all good. Life's like, good. When I was like, oh, how old was I? Like, yeah, I was 12, okay, and you found out. And, um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I remember that. And, um... <laughs> oh, she... Well, there was a period of grieving and that sort of thing, too. Yeah, but... Okay, and yeah, I remember, is. like, we've had ten talks or whatever, and it's just... You and your mum? Yeah, okay, like, yeah. from then to, I'll like... I'll turn this off, this is getting too yeah. personal. Okay. Do you want to have a swing? What? I don't want to have a swing. Yeah. I might break it, and then... I've just prep that... washed it, I'll just give it a coat of jam now. Now, this car's painted in acrylic, and I've already gone into detail about that. But for small items like brackets and this sort of thing, you can use this cheap spray paint. This is only about, this is enamel, and it's only about $4 a can. Now some of the more expensive paints can be up to about $15 a can for the same sort of thing. And as I mentioned, I've already painted the, um, or I painted the MG's heater box this stuff about nine years ago, it's nice and shiny. But if you've got a lot of things to paint, you're better off just buying a one litre can of it. This was $22.95. Um, and a one litre can by the time you thin it down, and a four litre of thinners is about $28. If you use your old can, it's under 20 for four litres, and that's the equivalent of about 40 cans of paint. Not that many, probably 20, but you can get an awful lot more out of it. And you can just shoot it out of a cheap gun like that. Now, here's our tail shaft. It's still wet, but it will dry with that sort of sheen on it. It's very, very shiny. And the other thing with it is, it's extremely hardy. Its adhesion's brilliant. And so for things like this, you're better off painting with a gun. Now, because it hasn't got its stripes anymore, it's very difficult to tell which is the front and the back. In fact, you can't tell one end from the other. So I've got my uh, little Dremel with an engraving bit and just engraved a tiny little F into there, into that yoke, or into that flange, sorry. And uh, that way I can tell where the yoke goes. But if you've only got one little thing to paint, the pressure packs are fine for this sort of thing. I'm using a little floodlight here to sort of show you the interior a bit better um, because the lighting's so terrible here in the garage. Those armrests and kick panels over there look like they're a totally different colour, and they kind of are, but in natural light they don't look bad at all. It's just under this artificial light. But you can see here the interior is pretty much finished now. Um, very happy with it. Just need to put that wood grain over there in the glove box door. And that's looking pretty good. So I'm happy with that. That's all good. So, uh, oh, I've got to put those trims up there. I've got to tuck that headlining up a little bit higher and put those trims up there. That wind lace needs to move over because it's so cold. It's only about five degrees in here at the moment. I'm going to wait till the weather warms up a little bit before I pull that off or at least heat it up with a gun or something like that. 
just to get it to the point where I can move it. And of course, here's the tail shaft. It's all nice and dry now. Um, I'm just going to paint the stripes on them. It's a bit of a wank, I suppose. I don't really need them, but I'm going to put them on. A couple of new unis, and I can put the tail shaft back in. And the only thing we really need to do now is get the exhaust done. Now, one of the other things I will do beforehand, it's all covered up, it's all gone to bed. Uh, one of the things I will do beforehand is I'll take off that temporary exhaust I made because initially I was going to drive it down to an exhaust place, but the bloke I want to use is a couple of suburbs away. He's a fair way from here, so I'll get it taken there on sort of the back of a truck. So this really is the second last video. I know I said it before and I feel a bit foolish, but this is the second last one. Um, so I wanted to spend, the reason I'm doing it like this is I wanted to spend half an hour on the final one and this one's already going to be up to about 40 odd minutes. And so then it would have gone well over an hour by the time I get robotis and exhaust and driver and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to cut this one off here um, and then there will be the final one and that will be in about four weeks. Rightio then, see you later.